Welcome back everyone. In this video we're going to talk a little bit about public spending and public choice theory. So in its most ideal form, the price system like we talked about last video, which allocates resources from lower valued to higher valued uses through, you know, voluntary exchange and price mechanisms. Um, in its ideal form, it, it, it is economically efficient and uh, mutually advantageous between the parties involved in trade. However, there are situations where the price system does not guarantee the desired results, right? It won't be economically efficient. This is what we call a market failure. It's a, a situation in which the market just naturally leads to too few or too many resources going to some specific economic activity. Uh, this can prevent economic efficiency, like I've said, and can sometimes limit maybe individual freedom. Uh, and in, in most often, it's, it must be addressed by public policy. So in a pure market system, economic efficiency occurs when individuals know and must bear the true opportunity cost of their action. Right? You can think about in some cases that the price that someone has to pay for a resource, a good, a service, it could be higher or even lower than the opportunity cost that all of society must pay. So let's think about what a market failure is, right? So let's assume we have no government regulation against pollution. We've got this beautiful town with clean air, and the steel mill opens up and starts, you know, emitting some pollution into the air. And there's respiratory problems, there's dirty clothes from all the soot, uh, there's houses that have, like, the soot on, like, the roofs, and, you know, you go to your car and you need a, a snow scraper to get all the soot off. So this is kind of a market failure, and why? Well, the steel mill, they're not paying for the clean air. They don't pay uh, uh, a pollution cost. There's this externality of having clean air, and they're not um, paying for sort of dirtying it, right? Costs of production, just to make the steel, have spilled over to the residents, to the third parties, to the towns, the homes, the cars, the soot, right? And this may... Uh, lower production cost if, if, if we uh, don't consider that higher price from the environmental damage, right, then we have more steel than should actually be produced if we uh, impose a price penalty on pollution. A word that you may have just heard me mention was externality, right? So what is an externality? So an externality occurs when the consequences of an economic activity spill over to affect third parties, right? You can consider the steel mill opening up and they do, you know, create steel and, and it happens to uh, adversely affect the residents of the town. You could even think about owning a home, right? And, uh, and you, you have a nice beautiful garden. Well, that beautiful garden that you made, your activity spills over to your neighbors because the property value increases on their homes, right? And we want to also think about what these neighbors, these third parties are. They're just people who are not directly involved in a given activity or transaction, right? Neighbors in the uh, garden example or residents of the town in the steel mill example. Um, and it's important to think of the property rights of who owns what. So market failures can occur when we fail to sort of internalize the externalities, right? If steel mills fail to uh, take into account the pollution, or perhaps you should be paid for uh, having a nice garden because you are uh, giving a boost to your neighbors, right? Uh, these externalities or failing to account for them are examples of market failure. Typically, we can think of externalities as uh, misallocations of resources, right? Sometimes there's external costs when the market overallocates or external ben benefits. The market is underallocating um, resources to something, right? And sometimes the government can come in and correct negative externalities. Perhaps they create a pollution tax on that, uh, that steel mill or they impose some regulation, right? 
So here's some example that you may want to pause and think about, uh, about you know, battles with pollution and car congestion in, in Beijing. So moving on, we want to think about a little bit how can government correct positive externalities, right? There's not enough of, uh, of something, right, enough resources in, in some economic activity. There's not, there's not enough good being done, perhaps, right? You can think about it like that. Well, sometimes the government can come in and finance uh, and kind of help production or offer up subsidy in production or, or just impose some form of regulation. In addition to dealing with market failures, there are other important economic functions of government. It could be providing a legal system, which we'll talk about in a second, promoting competition, providing public goods, or ensuring economy wide stability. All right, so let's think about what a legal system might mean for an economy. Well, suppose you and I have a contract. Well, what's to stop me from skipping out on the contract and running away? Well, that's a good function for government is to enforce contracts. We want, you know, this legal system that the government provides to define and protect property rights of who owns what really and why and how can we enforce that. And we want, you know, the government's legal system to establish legal rules of behavior. We also want the functions of government to include promoting competition, right? So a government should uh, kind of prevent a market failure from occurring if we have this uh, anti-competitive nature, right? We want this competition, you know, and, and we can do that in a couple of ways. We have what's called antitrust re le legislation and, and to kind of get rid of monopoly power. Right. So antitrust legislation, or they're just laws that restrict the formation of monopolies or cartels and regulate certain anti-competitive business practices. For example, forming a cartel. And a monopoly is a firm that can determine the market price. Right. In the extreme case, we have one seller of a good or service and that one seller gets to say what the price of the good or service is. So the other function of government that we might want to consider is uh, providing public goods, right? Go goods that, uh, that you know, we, we don't have uh, rival consumption, right? Goods are non-rivalrous in this case. Uh, these goods are, are goods that can be consumed jointly by many individuals at the same time, in contrast with private goods that can only be consumed by one individual at a time, right? Now, again, thinking about public goods, we have to think about, you know, well, public goods can be used by more and more people at no additional opportunity cost, then it's difficult to charge for a public good based on what's consumed, right? And this is called the exclusion principle. So oftentimes with public goods, you know, you have what's called the free rider problem. And this happens when some individuals are taking advantage of the fact that other people are going to pay for the public good, right? You know, if there are a hundred people out there who have definitely committed to paying for the public good, maybe I decide that I'm just going to go, you know, use the public good and, and not pay for it. Uh, it's already been paid for by the other hundred people. So the free rider problem often emerges in connection with sharing the burden of international defense, right? You think about, you know, I don't have to, you know, perhaps contribute. To the you know international defense fund sometimes the economy isn't so stable right you can sort of think of you know these spikes and downturns and maybe things are a little jagged sometimes we want the government to sort of help smooth how this process moves right um, and and there is the full employment act of 1946 you know congress sort of was tasked with uh uh, you know, ensuring economic growth and price stability and, and reaching um, full employment. And, and there are a number of ways that the government can sort of reach these tasks. Now, it could be that the government, in, in trying to ensure some sort of stability, proposes some sort of tax system and, and transfer system. And we're going to talk about those now. So we've got these transfer payments, monies that have been made by the government to individuals for which no services or goods are, are rendered in return, right? So you could think of like social security or unemployment benefits or, or insurance benefits. There are also transfers in kind, which are payments that take the form of some service or good. You can think of 
uh, the Food Stamp Act or, or subsidize public housing or medical care or transportation. An important thing to keep in mind when considering all these different types of transfers is who are the principal of the transfers, right? Is it the top, the federal level, or is it the state level or, or local, right? We know that Social Security is dealt out at the federal level, right, and, and income security and defense at the federal level, but education, state, hospitals, they can be at the state or local level. You may remember hearing that one of the important questions of economics is incentives and how incentives come into consideration in our everyday lives. So now we're going to talk a little bit about issues of public education, right? So state and local governments provide primary, secondary, and college educations at prices well below those that would otherwise prevail in the marketplace. Publicly subsidized, similar to how governments subsidize health care or agriculture, right? Education is priced below market. There are incentive problems that arise, though. Various measures of performance show no real increase or decline in performance, right? Many economists argue that failure to uh, improve uh, re relies on incentive effects, right? And we maybe just have higher subsidies that may translate to services unrelated to learning, right? So we may just think, oh, well, let's increase the funding. That'll solve it. But it, it may not necessarily. Here's sort of a, a real-world example, right? How, how college age aid can sometimes make college more expensive, right? The federal government has increased the amounts of grants and other subsidies given to colleges and students. These subsidies reduce students' net out-of-pocket tuition prices, which is good, so more students can, you know, enroll in colleges. And an increase in the demand for educational services that happens because of these subsidies can push up tuition prices above the level they were before. So perhaps this willingness to reduce price may actually increase, right? This is sort of an unintended consequence. So briefly talking about uh, public choice, we want to think about collective decision making, right? So how voters, politicians, and other public actors think about how to influence non-market decisions, right? So we've got this theory of public choice, which is this study of how collective decision making happens, right? And we, we just assume across the board that everyone interacting in these non-market processes, they want to uh, maximize their own individual well-being, right? So we've got to kind of think about uh, the similarities between the public sector and, and markets, right? Everyone's self-interested. They're trying to make themselves better off. Everyone's taking into account their next best, you know, possibility, their opportunity cost. Everyone's taking into account competition. And uh, everyone's taking into account uh, sort of everyone's uh, incentive structures, right? And so we want to think about what an incentive structure actually is. It's the system of rewards or punishments that you face after an action. Right? And there are some differences, of course, when we're talking about the public versus the market. We've got, you know, government can have goods at zero prices. They can use force. Uh, they can, they, they have voting versus spending. Uh, but the issue with voting versus spending is that voting uh, can happen by majority rule. But market systems, by, by and large, are by proportion. There's another really key difference that I want you to think about as you're moving on. You want to think about the difference really between voting and spending, right, and, and the differences between public and market uh, actions, right? Spending can indicate what you want. It can indicate this intensity. But voting really can't. If, if I see that A won a vote versus B, all I know is that A won over B. I don't know necessarily how much A beat B. When I see a market activity, I can find that.